Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. Now when he, that's Christ, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. Amen. On our Thursday evening Bible studies, we've been going through Galatians. And something that we just discussed this past Thursday is that one of the major themes, major themes of the New Testament is that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And this does not mean that Jesus will save every single individual in the world. What that does mean is that Jesus did not merely come to be the Savior of Israel, but he came to be the Savior of the world. In the Old Testament, well, when we say the Old Testament or Old Covenant, What's the Old Covenant? The Old Covenant is referring to the covenant made at Sinai with Moses between God and the nation of Israel. That was a Jewish covenant. That was a national covenant that God made with Israel, not with the other nations, but with Israel specifically. But that Old Covenant was for a time until Christ would come and fulfill it all and the gospel would go out to all nations. Even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prepares us for this. The Old Testament prophesies about this, prepares us for the day when the gospel will go out to all nations. For example, let me give you one fantastic passage in Isaiah 49. You're going to have to turn there right now. In Isaiah 49, there's this passage where we get a glimpse into a discussion within the Godhead itself where the Father is speaking to the Son. This is written 800 years before the time of Christ, and actually the Son is telling us what the Father has told him. And the Father has said to the Son, basically, you are too great of a Savior to just save some Jews. Rather, I am going to send you to be a light to the nations that my salvation may go to the ends of the earth. This was proclaimed from the Old Testament. Of course, Many of the Jews didn't quite get this, and they thought that God's sole purpose was there to bless Israel. Um, but this was always God's plan. It was always God's plan. But because the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is so focused upon Israel, the New Testament has to repeatedly stress the fact that God, that Christ came for all nations. It has to say this again and again in a multitude of ways. So, the Messiah was not merely meant to come for Israel. The Messiah is sent for every tongue, tribe, and nation. Sometimes, the New Testament will just give us flat-out, direct statements, like in Galatians chapter 3 that we looked at on Thursday, where it says there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. That's pretty straightforward. Other times, it will give us stories, like the passage that we have today, which illustrate the fact. So let's go through this text and see about this man who had faith in Christ, who was a Roman centurion. So let's start off verse 1. 
It says, Now when Christ concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Okay, so the sayings that it's referring to there are, it's at the end of chapter 6. End of chapter 6 in Luke is a smaller version of the Sermon on the Mount, basically. If you go to Matthew, you go to the Sermon on the Mount, and it's massive, it's three full chapters. Luke just gives us an abbreviated version of it at the end of chapter 6. It just gives us the highlights. But the idea is the same. Jesus is teaching who is part of the kingdom of God, who is blessed and who is not. Uh, he ends the same way that Matthew does, where he says, you know, the, the foolish man builds his house on sand, and the rains come, and the storms come, and everything collapses, but the wise man builds his house upon the rock, and the rains come, and the storms come, and it does not move, because he's built upon the rock. And the person who hears Jesus' sayings and does them is the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And one thing to note is that in none of these things, none of these sayings of Jesus is the one who is blessed or the one who is entering the kingdom, does at any moment have anything to do with his Jewishness. Rather, it has to do with people's heart and their faith. And that's what's illustrated in this passage, where we have the centurion who is not Jewish, He's a Gentile, he's a Roman soldier, and yet Luke gives him as a great example of faith. Verse 2, And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. Okay, so we're in Israel. Israel is not independent at this point in time. It is occupied by the Romans, the Roman Empire. And so we have Rome sending soldiers all over the, the empire to try and keep the peace. And you have Roman soldiers, of course, stationed in Israel, specifically in Capernaum. So we have the centurion here who's stationed in Capernaum. What's a centurion? He is an officer in the army over 100 men, hence centurion. Okay? This is not, you don't just get that job, oh, why don't you be a centurion? This is a guy who's been a soldier for a while, who has been... Uh, tested in battle and now has give, been given authority over a hundred men. Okay? Now, it's possible that this man, probable that this man, the centurion, possibly a proselyte to Judaism. What do I mean by that? There were people in the ancient world who were not Jews, but who came into contact with Judaism whether by Jews being scattered around the Roman Empire or by people <laughs> having gone to Israel, as is the case for this man. And there were people who had grown tired of the, the gods of their fathers and the Greek gods, and they saw the God of Israel, how this was a righteous God, how this was a, a God who was a savior, a holy God, and were attracted to this God. And some said, we are fully becoming Jews. Some people said, we're getting circumcised, we're following the law of Moses, we're, getting, we're being full Jews. Others didn't quite go that far, but they said, all right, well, we'll, we're interested in this God. We want to learn more about this God. We want to go to the synagogue and worship this God, even though they weren't Jews, but they, were, they wanted to worship the God of Israel. That's probably what's going on with this man, because, as we'll read a bit later, he loved the nation and had built them a synagogue. So he's probably, probably a, a proselyte. So he's a man who was sent to Israel for his job and then came into contact with the God of Israel and now has come to believe in him. It's probably what's going on with this man. What else do we know? He has a servant and he loves his servant people who don't love their servants. There are people who mistreat their servants. They could care less about them. He loves his servant. It says there was a servant who was dear to him. I was looking at that in the Greek. It's, it's almost that it was dear to him. It, he, he honored him. The centurion honored the servant. He loved him so much. Okay? And so the, ser the servant is so sick he's about to die. In the parallel passage in Matthew, where Matthew gives us the same story, he says he was in a lot of pain. A lot of pain and dying. So what's the centurion? He doesn't know what to do. Nothing he can do. But he hears that Jesus is coming. Verse 3. 
So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Now, the centurion does not go himself, and he sends elders of the Jews to Jesus, which is quite a unique situation. You don't ordinarily have elders of the Jews going and pleading for a Gentile <laughs> on his behalf, but they're willing to do it. Um, they speak very well of him, probably, be probably because he was a proselyte. If not, he had definitely given a ton of money for the synagogue. <laughs> to build a synagogue, that's a lot of money. So they like the guy. They may not like other Gentiles, but they like this guy. Okay, so they're willing to go on his behalf and they plead with Jesus. Now, the man's message was, he tells the elders, go tell Jesus that I have the servant who is sick. Okay. The Jewish elders decide to add a little something that the man did not say, just to try and gain the favor of Jesus even more. What do they say? They say you should help him because he is deserving. Axios, which means worthy. I don't know why they wrote deserving there. It's the same word that is used later. It's the word worthy. You should help him because he's worthy. That's why you should help him. Well, why is he worthy? He loves Israel. He's built us a, t a synagogue. He's worthy. He deserves for you to help him. Other people don't deserve to be helped, but this one deserves to be helped because he's worthy. He's one of the good guys, so you should help him. This is how religious people think. A lot of religious people think. Who don't really understand the depths of our sin, who don't really understand the grace of God. Here's how a lot of people think. If I do enough good things, then I earn God's favor. If I'm just good enough, then I am worthy of God's blessing. This person has done a lot of good stuff, they say. Therefore, he is worthy. He deserves for you to help him. That's their, that's their argument. He deserves for you to help him. That's how people think. That's why when bad things happen, how many times do people say, oh, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm a good person, why do bad things happen to me? Of course, Romans 3 will say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one, God doesn't owe anyone anything, okay? We are sinners who have sinned against God so many times, it's not even... It's not even a thing anymore. No one deserves the blessings of God. No one is good enough to say, I am worthy, so you should give me good stuff, as these people think. Everything we have and everything we are is by the grace of God, not because you deserved it. They say he's worthy, so you should help him. Jesus ignores their bad theology. He knows that there's a man who is in pain and in need. So he says, all right. And he decides to go with them. Verse 6. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. Again, he doesn't go. He sends friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, I have, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes into my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus is on his way. You've got the whole crowd, the people who came to get him. Jesus is on his way to the centurion's house. He's close by. I don't know what the centurion was thinking. He probably wasn't thinking that Jesus was going to come. 
and Jesus is coming to his house. And so now, again, he doesn't go. He sends friends to go out and stop Jesus from coming. And he says, no, 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 don't come to my house. And what is his first words? Don't trouble yourself. I am not worthy. The elders came and said, you should come because he's worthy. He says, don't come. I'm not worthy. The exact opposite. They're both asking for the same thing, but they are expecting Jesus' help because, well, the guy's good. He is hoping for Jesus' help because Jesus is gracious. Not because of anything in him, but because Jesus is the one who's good and maybe he'll help me. He says, I am not worthy that you would enter under, that you would enter under my roof because I am not worthy. You have here a man who understands his sinfulness and he understands that Jesus is holy and he is coming and he's like, maybe I shouldn't be in this man's presence because he is holy and I am not. I have, you read commentaries on this and they'll say, well, maybe the man, he understood Jewish traditions and Jewish customs and Jewish customs said that, Gentile, that Jews are not allowed to go into Gentiles' homes because they'll get defiled. And so maybe this centurion, he knows the Jewish tradition and he doesn't want to cause any trouble for Jesus and for the people around him, so he's saying, don't come into my house. But that's not what the text says. The text tells us why he didn't want Jesus to come into his house. And he says, because I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy for you to be in my house. He says, in verse 7, he says, that's why I didn't come to you. That's why I didn't come to you in the first place. I didn't come to you in the first place. I didn't come to you in the second place. First he sent the elders, then he sent his friends. He is not going out to meet Jesus because I am not worthy to be in your presence. Do you remember, this actually a bit early in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is by the lake of Capernaum, and Peter has been out, trying to fish all night, and he's got nothing. And Jesus says to him, did you catch anything? No, I don't have anything. All night, got nothing. And Jesus says to him, well, why don't you go and throw your nets on the other side of the boat? Really? I could see Peter being like, <laughs> you know that this is my job, right, carpenter? You know this is my job, right, preacher? But, and I've thrown the nets all over the place all night, but he says, fine, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. And they go out and they throw the nets on the other side of the boat and you know the story, all the fish of the lake of Capernaum jump into his net. There's so much that the nets are tearing, they have to call other people to come over to, and the boat starts sinking, there's just too many fish. Peter does not say, wow. I don't have to work for the next couple of weeks because look at all this money I'm going to make right now. He turns to Jesus and he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. That's his argument. He realizes that he is in the presence of a holy person and, he know, and all he can think about is his sin. Please leave. I'm a sinful man. And this centurion knows that he is unworthy. He knows that Jesus is holy. And Jesus is coming to his house and he says, I'm not worthy for you to come. If someone said to you, Jesus is coming to your house, wouldn't that be exciting? You would love that. Clean the house, get a nice meal, sit down and eat with Jesus, ask him any questions you have. Take some pictures, put them online. Selfie. Take a selfie with Jesus. Hashtag savior of the world. This man says, I'm not worthy to have Jesus in my house. And he says to Jesus, just say the word. And I know that my servant will be healed. I know that you have such authority that if you just say it, he'll be fine. Just say the word and he'll be fine. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha? Mary and Martha, Lazarus's sisters. 
Very similar story. Jesus is away. Lazarus is sick. They send messengers to him saying, Lazarus is sick. Can you come help? Jesus does not go on purpose because he is planning on letting Lazarus die so that then he can do the massive miracle of raising him from the dead four days later. But Jesus doesn't go. When he finally shows up, Martha runs out to meet him. First words that come out of her mouth. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Is that true? She leaves, she goes back, she gets her sister. Mary comes out, identical. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I don't want to scold them too much because their brother had just died and they're sad. They're mourning. I get it. But they're wrong. Theologically, they're wrong. Jesus does not need to be there in order to heal Lazarus. The centurion isn't even concerned about it. The centurion is correct. He says, I don't need you to come. In fact, I don't want you to come. I know that you are so powerful that if you just say it from wherever you are, my servant will be healed. It's just a matter of you willing it. And he doesn't stop there. This is amazing. He gives an example to Jesus, almost like a parable. You know how when Jesus does teaching and he'll say something just to make sure that he can emphasize it and we can understand it better, he'll give examples, he'll give parables and stuff like that. Here, this man gives an example to Jesus to try and explain it to Jesus in case Jesus isn't getting it. He says, you have authority. I know that. He says, look, I'm a man of authority. I know what authority is. I have people who are under me. Uh, I have people who are over me who give me commands and I have to do them. I have people who are under me who I give commands and they have to do it. When I tell someone, one of my soldiers in my command to go do something, I don't have to take him by the hand and go with him and make sure that he does it. I have authority and when I say it, it gets done. I know that that's how authority works. And I know that if you just say it, It'll happen. <laughs> Verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus marveled at him. Him. Jesus is amazed with the man. Ordinarily, it's not difficult. Just do a really quick scan of the Gospels, and you will find Jesus saying things and doing things where people are constantly amazed. Jesus is always doing things that people are always amazed. This is the one time in all four Gospels that Jesus is amazed with someone else. Nowhere else. Jesus is amazed with this man's faith. How about that? How would you like to be the one person in the Bible that Jesus is amazed with your faith? And he says that he has great faith. There are places where Jesus is amazed with people's unbelief, he was in Nazareth in Mark chapter 6, and he's preaching there, and he's doing miracles there, and they don't believe in him. And he's amazed that they don't believe. Here he is amazed at this man's great faith. I was reading this, and I'm like, man, I want to be like this guy. I want to be like this centurion here. Then my correct theology Goes, comes in the back of my head, and I'm like, okay, Nico, it, no. My goal should not be to be like a centurion. My goal should be to be like Jesus. Jesus is the one who is our ultimate example. Jesus is the one to whom we are to be conformed to. I get it. Yes, that's right. The centurion is not my goal. Jesus is my goal. But <laughs> sometimes I see where I am, and I see where Jesus is, and I'm like, I would be content, content if I could be as good as the centurion, if I had enough faith as the centurion. <laughs> of course, Jesus is our ultimate goal, but it seems like a step up to be this man and his great faith. You don't find that often. How often does Jesus say to his disciples, to Peter, 
O ye of little faith. And here he says to this centurion, this man, I have not found this great faith anywhere. I've been all over Israel and I have not found such great faith. What is so amazing about this man? He understands his sinfulness. He understands his unworthiness. He understands Jesus' holiness. I've often said, if you understand those two things, if you understand your own sinfulness, and if you understand God's holiness, everything else will just fall into place. Everything in the Bible will suddenly make sense. We tend to think a bit too high of ourselves and not highly enough of God. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples, without me you can do nothing? Remember that? And as good old Martin Luther would say, nothing does not mean a little something. Nothing. You know the reason your heart is beating right now is because Jesus is making a beat? The centurion understands all this, and Jesus says, I have not found such great faith. And he doesn't stop there. He could have just stopped there. But he says, I have not found so much faith even in Israel. You didn't have to add that. He's talking to Jews. I've been all around Israel. I've, every person, practically every person that I talk to is an Israelite. And I have not found such faith as I have in this Gentile over here. And if you go to the Gospel of Matthew... He, in the parallel passage, he even adds, and many will come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while others will be cast out. Why? Because it's not a matter of your genealogy. It's a matter of faith in Christ. Salvation is not about being Jewish. It's not about being worthy enough. No one is. God except those who understand their unworthiness and trust and hope in Christ alone. That's the message. There's one more verse. Let me close it off. Verse 10. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. <laughs> Amen. I have nothing more to add to that. <laughs> Let's pray.